All right. Welcome back, everyone. I think you know who she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, earlier, we raised the question of, you know, can you grow excellent food outside of the soil? And we're really going to explore that today with Jonathan Webb from App Harvest. And obviously, he's not here. He's, um, he's joining us remotely. Um, but we're really also honored to have Martha Stewart in conversation with, with Jonathan here. Uh, Martha, as you can see, she tore Achilles, ruptured. ruptured her Achilles tendon. And like through this swampy mess, in addition to being really smart, thoughtful, one of the most remarkable businesswomen in the world, she is wicked resilient. And we really, really appreciate that she's here. And this woman has kind of single-handedly really changed the way we think about food, service, preparation, consumption, and all the world that grows around food. So I'm, I've learned a lot from Martha. She's been extremely generous to me as an individual and to the College of the Atlantic. I remember, um, I think it was 1980, it was a celebrity... Jeopardy, right? And um, I, I remember watching it 20 years later, and I would, Martha said, yes, my, my uh, charity is the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine. That was so wonderful. And um, from that time, it's really developed into a great relationship. So I'm going to stop talking and get off the stage and welcome Martha Stewart and Jonathan Webb. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Darren. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today, despite the difficulty of getting from Bedford, New York, um, to um, my house, which, by the way, you cannot go from one room to another without some stairs. And so, so I was worried about it. And you can't get in a plane because you can't climb up the stairs. And it's like a pain in the neck. But um, this is the fourth, fourth and a half week, and, uh, and I'm doing very well. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm more progressed than my doctor thought I would be at this point. So um, that's me. But, um, but what we're talking about today is something that has interested me for a very long time. Uh, I think it was 1990, um, Darren, when I, when I did Celebrity Jeopardy, by the way. Um, and I won. I had no idea what I was doing. My daughter said, Mom, if you're going on Celebrity Jeopardy, watch a couple programs and know how to do it. And uh, I said, oh, I'm, I'm OK. I had never, ever watched Celebrity Jeopardy. And, uh, and I beat out uh, the host, and I beat out um, a couple other really difficult, Charles Barkley, the basketball player. I even got the basketball question first. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. But it was fun to give uh, my, my um, Celebrity Jeopardy earnings to College of the Atlantic. Uh, when I bought my house up here, I met, uh, I had followed, but I had not met, a man called Elliot Coleman. Elliot is, like, to me, the father of what's going on now called Controlled Environment uh, Agriculture, CEA. Um, it's, that also stands for a lot of other more horrible things like cancer or something and stuff. And, but we want to talk, think about controlled environment agriculture. And uh, Jonathan Webb um, is um, uh, in the line uh, of those, those fantastic growers who um, really are thinking about the future of where our food, our good food, is going to come from. Uh, after Elliot and his, and his growing in unheated greenhouses year-round here in Maine, I got really inspired to have a vegetable greenhouse that where I could grow all my salads and my spinach from my green juice and my cucumbers all winter long. So I do have a vegetable greenhouse in the ground, just like Elliot Coleman taught me. Then, we, then along comes another guy called Dan Barber. Uh, Dan Barber started with the help of the Rockefellers in Pocantico Hills, right near Bedford, where I live, on a farm. Uh, he started growing uh, both outside and indoors beautiful, beautiful food for use in his restaurant. Uh, the, it's called Stone uh, Barns, uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. And what, what wonderful food, what innovative cuisine, what uh, really uh, attention to detail uh, our friend Dan Barber uh, creates each and every day at that restaurant. You'll hear him speak later on today, I think at 5 o'clock. And then along comes, then I, then I travel. 
I travel to Russia where I see acres and acres and acres of agriculture under glass. I go to Holland where the same thing is happening. Uh, go to pretty much any country nowadays and there are experiments in growing under glass for the populace. Good food, delicious food in controlled environments. And then where did we meet Jonathan? Jonathan Webb is on the screen behind me. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, you Martha, good. how are you doing? You've had a thank, long thank week, you. Jonathan. I'm on this. I serve on the board of App Harvest. That's how I got to know Jonathan. But Jonathan, tell tell where we met in the first place. Well, Martha, um, like like any of us that that, that are pursuing a, a career in food, you're you're an icon that we all know. And uh, me growing up in Kentucky, um, and and I'm actually calling in today from uh, Russell County Public Library. So. Uh, so happy to be here in, in Kentucky today. Wish I could be with you in Maine, but uh, we'll get up there soon enough. Um, you know, there were only a few names that, that when we started this, this mission here at App Harvest, which is, you know, grow more food using less resources, use less water, less land, uh, and, and more importantly, get harsh, harsh chemicals out of the growing practice. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a background in building large scale solar. I was not in the food industry and uh, getting into it was thinking, well, if I had to pick two or three people in the world uh, to, to help try to think through this problem and how we best form a solution around the problem, uh, your name kept rising to the top. So uh, I believe it was a year and a half ago or more, uh, I all but went uh, to Park City to track you down and, and stock you at Chef Dance, uh, where your team was gracious enough to give me a minute or two of your time in a hallway. Uh, and then I think uh, compelled you enough to where we eventually went and met at your office in New York. And I, I remember that meeting uh, in, in, at your office in New York City and sat down with you for about an hour and just laid out the case of you know, what the problems are in food and agriculture and what we're working to do here to, to be a part of the solution. And uh, here we are today, Martha, I guess a year and a half or two later that, uh, that now we're having this conversation. So, so it all started from... Uh, from I believe Chef Dance in Park City is where where I initially uh, that, initially that was a, f a fun long weekend in the in the beautiful uh, Utah countryside. Well, um, I've been thinking a lot about the fragility of our food system, and I knew that what Jonathan was talking about was really what I wanted to support. I really wanted to understand how we, as a world of billions of people, were going to feed our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren in the future without relying on the fragility of nature. Nature has been very unkind to us in the last couple of years. Uh, look at the fires in California, the terrible drought, the terrible heat waves that are co coursing across our country. And uh, not that we're sitting in a in the most beautiful place, Jonathan. It is misty and rainy this morning. It rained all night. Mm -hmm. The forest is green. It's cool. It's actually cold mm -hmm. enough to wear a down vest. And uh, and here we are, you know, talking about the hideous, hideous heat wave that's going across America right now. But what you're doing makes use of some of the most uh, uh, common common things. Rainwater. Talk about talk about what. What got you where you are today? I mean, he had now has his first greenhouse in Moorhead, Kentucky, in Appalachia, with Appalachian people, people who might have been out of work or needed new jobs, uh, working in these amazing facilities. Talk about, talk about that, Jonathan. Yeah, Martha. So uh, for me, it, it's all about the problem, right? So my, my career before App Harvest was... Uh, in renewable energy. So I grew up in Kentucky, uh, one of the largest coal producing states in the U.S., uh, and seeing really the collapse of the coal industry over the last decade, uh, while I was a part of building some of the largest solar projects in the U.S., uh, and just seeing one industry decline as another industry uh, emerged and took off. Um, and for me, App Harvest, it really, it, it was about the problem. I, I was you know, deep in the wonky world of the environmental community where, you know, you're, you're reading all the reports, you're, you're going to the conferences, you're, you're seeing everyone talk about um, carbon, right? So every, we're all worried about global warming. Uh, 
Uh, but then you start to look at the problems with food and agriculture. And, and I'm biased because I spend all day doing it now every day. But the problems in food and agriculture are a bigger ex existential threat uh, to humanity than that even of energy. Uh, and we don't talk about it. It's something, you know, you look at the mainstream news, you look at the political discourse on the left or the right in D.C., you look at the environmental nonprofits all day, every day. All we talk about is energy, energy, energy. And as somebody who built large solar, you know, I can appreciate that. But at the same time, you know, the basis for human civilization is food, uh, water and energy. And, and, you know, why are we on this wonderful planet? It's the only planet we know of in the known universe that has abundance amount of water. Uh, and that that's why we're here. That's why there's life. That's why there's humans. Uh, and that water is it's it's under threat. And and, you know, you look at California, you look at the Southwest and as somebody that grew up in coal country, you know, we talk about extractive resources like fossil fuels and how we extract the resource out of the ground. Why are we not talking about the way we're extracting our water out of our freshwater reservoirs? That water is not replenishing. You look at the Colorado River, it's drying up. The Hoover Dam, it's depleting. You look at the freshwater reservoirs in California, they're drying up. And when 95% of a fruit and vegetable is water, and if you don't have that water to grow that fruit and vegetable, you won't have food. And it's that simple. Uh, and so for me at App Harvest, we, we started this company. Uh, we're a B Corp. We're a benefit corporation. Uh, there's about five uh, companies that are public on a major exchange that are both a B Corp and a public benefit uh, corporation. We wanted to build a company that was much more than just a company. It was it was it was focused on tackling a problem. Uh, and for us, it's it's very simple. How do we you know, get to 9 billion people by 2050 as a planet? How do we get to, you know, 70% or 50% more food production by 2050 while climate disruption, no matter whether we like it or don't like it, climate disruption is escalating. There's going to be more drought. There'll be more wildfire. Uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to grow more food. And and Martha, you opened up with uh, mentioning Dan Barber. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Dan. I, I've never met him, never been to Stone Barns, but I'm a huge fan. You know, for me, I've, I've idolized Wendell Berry here in Kentucky, you know, a four season organic farmer. And I think we as, as the food community should prioritize and make sure we put at the top you know, that four season organic farmer that treats the soil properly and treats waterways properly. But the reality is we're not going to have the luxury. You know, human civilization is not going to have the luxury to feed planet Earth simply by using organic soils. We're not going to. The math doesn't add up. Go sit down with any Ph.D., any economist, anyone. And, and it's simple math. How do you get enough food consistently to, to feed 1.5 billion people in China and 1.5 billion people in India when both India and China account for 10% or less of the world's fresh water. I mean, those, those two areas alone have almost 40% of the world's population, less than 10% of the world's fresh water. So with controlled environment agriculture, we can grow a fruit and vegetable with 90% less water. We get 30 times more yield per acre. Uh, and, and again, we're freeing up a tremendous amount of land and a tremendous amount of water so that people like Wendell Berry and Dan Barber can go and grow tremendous food organically in the soils and not have to have that pressure on them to get a ridiculously uh, unrealistic yield. Uh, and so that's, you know, for me, Martha, I, CEA is a complement, you know, to those open field farmers that are doing it right. But we all need to coalesce around you know, there's a segment, a large segment, maybe 80 or 90 percent of farming that should not exist in 2021. You know, there's no reason we're still farming today like we farmed in the early 1900s. That There's a segment of farming, the industrialized farming, that's just heavy, heavy uh, chemical going into the soil, trying to get unrealistic yields. That segment of the farming all needs to go away. Uh, and we need to create a new system. And ideally, uh, Martha, I'm very idealistic and hopeful that, you know, that what will emerge will be those really good four season organic farmers, along with CEA, we're complementing each other, and we're creating a better food system that, that's affordable and available for everyone. Well, that sounds reasonable and, and, and absolutely doable. 
and uh, and that you are focused on that is is admirable. So. Um, I went to Israel a few years ago, and I drove up the Gaza Strip. Uh, on the left, Gaza. On the right, Israel. You drive up. It's the difference is astonishing. On the left, just a wasteland of plastic blowing on arid soil, uh, unirrigated, not a thing growing. On the right, a lush, verdant landscape. The the Israelis knowing how to farm being careful about their farming on the left, casual, uh, you know, these are desert people trying to make the land arable and not knowing how to do it. It was hideous, the difference between the two. And that's what's happening even in America. Uh, if you read the New York Times this week, talking about the, the beautiful cattle that have been raised and bred for dealing with climate change, and, but they have no hay to eat. They're not growing enough food even for the cattle that people want to raise for meat in America. So these problems exist and, and that what you're doing is showing us a new, or well, not exactly new, but a different way to grow a delicious food uh, in a controlled atmosphere. Um, why did you focus originally, this, talk about Moorhead first, your first greenhouse, because that's wow. what, where I have been, and it's just an incredible environment. Why, tell us, us about how you got that constructed in the first place. Yeah, so our, our Moorhead, Kentucky facility, and if you're sitting at home, kind of Google it, look it up on a map. Uh, we're, we're in eastern Kentucky, which has been known as coal country, really, uh, it, the central Appalachian area. Uh, almost 3 million square feet under glass. You know, so the concept with App Harvest is build really big, economies of scale. I mean, what we have, what I have to compete with and our team here, we have to compete with, you know, low cost imports coming in from south of the border where you have, you know, the EPA can't track the chemicals, they can't track the, the chemical pesticides, can't track the growing practice, and that's what's ending up on our store shelves. But you know, we can't fix that or solve that, but what we can do is create a product uh, that, that, that we grow. So for us in our first facility, we're growing tomatoes. Uh, people ask why tomatoes? It's the number one import from Mexico. Almost 4 billion pounds of tomatoes were imported into the U.S. last year. So we're trucking. If you look at the way we as the U.S. have constructed our food system, you know, we're either shipping fruits and vegetables two to 3,000 miles from Mexico to the East Coast or we're shipping them 2,000 miles from California or the southwest of the U.S. to the East Coast. Moorhead, Kentucky is within a one-day drive of almost 70% uh, of the U.S. So we can get to the Northeast, we can uh, New York City, Detroit, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., down to Atlanta, down to Florida, all within a one-day drive. Uh, so what we're doing here, Martha, as you know, and 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 just kind of recapping the, the 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 strategy here is building large scale infrastructure to grow a fruit and vegetable with ninety percent less water, thirty times yield per acre, and do it where we can run completely on recycled rainwater. We don't use any city water. We have a closed loop system, so none of that rainwater goes off. We have no agricultural runoff in our in our facilities, uh, and then once we create that product it gets to a consumer within a one day drive. Uh, so why Moorhead, Kentucky? Uh, because of the geographic location. We, we, can, we, can, we can get to a consumer within a day drive. But then if you also look at the climate maps and you look at climate disruption, it's not all equal. So yes, California is drought stricken. The Southwest is drought stricken. Uh, I'm sitting in Kentucky where we've had our wettest decade on state record. We've had three of our wettest years in state history in the last decade. So what better place to build large infrastructure to collect rainwater, uh, to grow a fruit and vegetable in, in an area of the country that's getting wetter and wetter? So, you know, why Moorhead, location, water? But then third thing, Martha, and, and I don't, you know, talk about it too much, but I believe, you know, the people of this region that powered this country through the coal, you, you, you look at the Industrial Revolution on, you know, coal... Yes, it is fading out and, and the U.S. has decided to, to phase out of coal. But the hardest working men and women in the U.S. are in coal country. They deserve a job. They deserve a livelihood and they deserve a future. Uh, and we at App Harvest, we're not a silver bullet by any means for, for what's going to come in uh, and create new jobs in coal country. 
Uh, but we as a country owe it to this region uh, to bring new industry. Uh, and I believe one of our largest competitive advantages here at App Harvest is the men and women of this region. And when people tell me people don't want to work in agriculture, uh, I invite them to Moorhead, Kentucky. We invite we hired 500 people in the middle of COVID. Everyone at App Harvest makes a living wage. Everyone at App Harvest has full health care benefits for the, them and their family. And everyone at App Harvest has equity in this company. We have men and women who have never worked in high tech agriculture, who've never worked in every single day to get better to run our facilities. So yes, I'm really proud of what we're doing, but most importantly, I'm proud of the people here that are that are helping make it possible. And ultimately, I think that's our biggest competitive advantage uh, against many other players out there uh, is the region itself. So one of the reasons that I really love Jonathan Webb is his passion. You can hear it in his voice. You can hear it in his in his delivery of, of his of his um, wonderful mission. Um, and you remind me so much. I I, I grew up in business. Um, uh, pretty much, uh, even though I was located on the um, East Coast, I pretty much grew up in Silicon Valley with Steve Jobs, with Jeff Bezos, with Bill Gates. Those were my buddies. Um, those young guys. Uh, were my buddies. I, I was entertained by them. I visited them at their homes. And I learned about this passion for technology, for for pioneerism in the new age. This We're in the new age right now, aren't we, Jonathan? We live in, in where, where technology can be brought into a greenhouse and coax tomato plants to grow 45 feet tall and last as productive vegetation for nine months. Growing tomatoes on one plant for nine months. I was blown away when I visited App Harvest and that first greenhouse. And the tomatoes were delicious. Picked off the vine. We were, we were, we were running some, uh, some of your pictures uh, just uh, before we, we started to talk, Jonathan, of uh, eating those delicious, delicious red ripe tomatoes picked right off the vine. Uh, why tomatoes, first of all? Is that, just the, is that because you're competing with the, the inferior tomatoes from, from Mexico? Maybe we're too simple here in Kentucky, Martha. But again, we went, what is the number one import into this country on a fruit and vegetable? And it was tomatoes. By the end of next year, uh, we'll have leafy greens, we'll have strawberries, and we'll have tomatoes. Uh, but we really wanted to start with, yes, tomato. And, and why tomatoes? Uh, it's it's terrifying, Martha. You, you look at USDA studies that'll say there's five, six, seven, eight, demo, eight different chemicals that are on uh, on a tomato. Um, I, I grew up eating a lot of fruits and vegetables growing up. My mom always, always ate fruits and vegetables. Uh, we never got organic food. My mom has leukemia. And in the U S we deserve a better food system not just for people that can go to a high-end restaurant in Boston. I talked about for passion. Every Jonathan is one of the most passionate young men. How old are you, Jonathan? I'm 36, Martha. 36 years old. We got, th we, 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 we got a 30 years to go, Martha. And I'm sorry, but th this one is a very important, <laughs> you know, the correlation between what we put on our food and, you know, here... I'm sitting in, again, Russell County Public Library. We go to large grocers. We buy fruits and vegetables. We think we're giving our family something healthy. I agree with you totally. My, my daughter, and my daughter. With, and it's dumped with chemicals, Martha, and it's dumped with chemicals, and we got to do better. And yes, we need the organic farmers, but we also have to look at what's going on these conventional products. And so here at App Harvest, we've got to figure out how to grow a lot more food with a lot less resources and, and get the harsh chemicals off of it. So for me, Martha, this is incredibly personal. It's incredibly personal. I don't want my family or my friends having to question if they go to a grocery store, is it going to poison them? Yeah. Well, you're right. Uh, my daughter, Alexis, has two young children, nine and 10. We eat 
pretty much only organically. I grow as much as I can on my little farm in Bedford, New York. Uh, we're eating out of an amazing garden right here in Seal Harbor. Um, we, my daughter gave me the list of things that were forbidden in the house. Grapes, just supermarket grapes. Highest, highest incidence of pesticides and chemicals in those grapes. The same thing with soft fruits, the same thing with a lot of the lettuces. We have to be very careful about what we eat and we are all extremely healthy and, uh, and we hope that we can stay that way and live the longest that we can possibly live. I'm sorry to hear about your mom um, and I hope, I hope well, she, it's it, under it, control. It, it, she's healthy, it's fine. She's gonna live yeah. a, a long, great life. But you yeah. know, the reality is, and again, is, is we have to figure out how, how to, to move quickly. We're in 2021 in the largest economy in the world. And for you know, the average, here at App Harvest, we're focused on the, on the average everyday consumer. The 90% of people that go to Costco, Walmart, Kroger, Wendy's, McDonald's, how do we get healthy food there? And, and, and that's the challenge, which is, you know, you look at a, a nice restaurant in New York City, it could be $400 a person. You know, there's people around here that make less than thirty thousand dollars a year. Stone Barnes is about four hundred dollars a person if you if you get um, some good wine along with your dinner. And so, how do people here get good, healthy food when they only have ten dollars to spend or less on a meal, or maybe twenty dollars for their entire family? But that we should not have to make these choices where a family has to think. Is this really, if I'm buying a fruit and vegetable and I'm trying to give my kid a healthy, nutritious meal, but is it layered in, in stuff that's ultimately going to poison them? So, you know, Martha, that, that's the question. Not only do we have to grow more food with climate disruption, not only do we have to grow more food with less land and less water, you know, but how do we do it to where we're not pushing the crop so hard with these unrealistic uh, chemicals that ultimately are, are causing you know these high cancer rates, leukemia, any anything and everything we see that is off the charts in the last 20 years. You look at industrialized farming from 1950 on, and you look at the correlation of all of the wonky, wild, crazy diseases that have risen in the Western world. There's a direct correlation between industrial farming in 1950 and 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 all these cancers and diseases that have risen. So you know, for for me, Martha, I think the challenge is, and, and with the College of Atlantics, and thank you all for having me here is is how do we make this affordable and available for everyone and and what you know what responsibility is that is it, is it is it a grocer's responsibility is it a grower's responsibility is it the federal government but every single person in this country deserves clean healthy food and the challenge is Martha how do we do it right so in Moorhead you have one operational greenhouse at present uh, the company went public, App Harvest went public on February 1st of this year uh, in a SPAC, which is a, a, a newfangled way of, of going public, a you're sort of backing into another company, and uh, to great fanfare and lots and lots of investor interest. Because we're all, many of us are very concerned about the food supply and the food chain, and we want to support um, companies like App Harvest uh, to in their in their quest for learning how to uh, experimenting with and growing food in a new and different way. Um, so you chose more. You chose Moorhead. Describe how you uh, plant a tomato plant at Moorhead, because right now you have three million square feet of tomatoes growing. How how do you grow them exactly? Where did the seed come from? So all, all the different systems, we're working with a lot of the major seed companies. Uh, it's, it's a non-GMO seed. Uh, if you look at uh, why genetically modified seeds really exist today, it's a couple of reasons, but mainly transportation. You know, they're, they're genetically modifying a seed so that you can pick a tomato uh, or, or fruit and vegetable in south of, you know south of the border almost 3000 miles away ship it 2 weeks on a truck so those tomatoes that are being imported are sitting almost 2 weeks on a semi truck uh, and that that's a genetically modified seed that ensures that product can last on the truck we use uh, a naturally bred seed um, and then we're growing uh, only in water with nutrients. So yes, we do not use soil. Uh, and and you know we were on that cover of the New York Times food section a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I know Dan Barber was mentioned in there. Uh, and and there's great great points about 
well, you don't have the microbes in, in, the, in the water the way you would have in the soil. Uh, and, and there's a lot of studies that have been done, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, that show that you know, the way we're growing uh, does not have a material impact, positive or negative, uh, versus the way you would grow in a soil with microbes. Uh, I, I personally do believe microbes are the next unknown of, of this planet. And, and we there's so much to be discovered with microbes. Um, and ultimately, in a, in a perfect world, Martha, in four or five or six years, we, can, we will be adding microbes to our water and nutrients, uh, but only adding the microbes that, that will actually benefit uh, a human. So there, there's microbes in the soil now that we have no idea what they are. Some of them are good. Some of them are not good for humans. Uh, some of them are good for a plant. Some of them aren't good for a plant. And in a controlled environment facility, you know, theoretically, what you should be able to do is control the environment top to bottom to optimize for the plant. Give that plant exactly what it wants year round. Uh, and, and I do think that the next unknown that we all need to solve for is how do we how do we put the microbes into the water, into the nutrients? How does that impact the plant? Uh, and ultimately, how does it impact the nutrient density uh, for the consumer? But I think, again, Martha, the disconnect and make sure, you know, ideally, this can be a big table where we can all sit at it, invite more people to the table and keep sharing ideas. But, you know, this concept that CEA versus organic farming, we got that that has got to go away. I know many people and I can't speak for other CEOs, but I, I have my I don't have any grass at my house. I only grow vegetables uh, and I try to eat all the vegetables I can from the garden. So, you know, priority number one, grow vegetables at home, eat from your backyard, you know, but but that's not going to feed the entire world. And and no, uh, is CEA and organic the same? No, they're not the same. But CEA can be a much, much better uh, path than what we see in conventional today. And Martha, what we're trying to replace is the 90% of just absolutely horrid conventional product that's making it into the marketplace. Uh, and that's ultimately here, here what we're trying to do. But, you know, how are we growing? Pretty simply, we're using rainwater. So, you know, something that's pretty unique to App Harvest is we run completely on recycled rainwater. Uh, and, and we, as a result, have a closed loop system where we have no agricultural runoff. City water uh, has sodium. And when you run sodium through a hydroponic system, that sodium builds up and you have to flush it. Rainwater has no sodium. So us running completely on recycled rainwater uh, allows us to, to run consistently, not have to have any agricultural runoff. So a simple way to describe this, once rainwater goes into our facility, uh, it only leaves as a packaged fruit and vegetable. So once water and that rainwater goes in, the only thing that leaves our, our facility is a fruit and vegetable. Uh, and, and look, is it is it perfect? No, I don't think anything is perfect. Growing in the soil is not perfect. You know, the amount of arsenic and the amount of chemicals that are in American soil today no matter what state you're in, or even if you think you have a good moderate level soil, th these soils we've poisoned and degraded globally. You know, so the, the benefit with CEA is we know exactly what is going into that plant. You know, the thing that we need to solve for as it relates to four season organic farming is what is actually in the soil and is it good soil or have, have we as humans already poisoned that soil uh, that have compromised the health of the plant, ultimately the health of, of the consumer. So the soil loyalists versus the um, under glass loyalists, um, they, they, there's, you know, I, I think that any dissension in those, in those groups really does have to, have to be smoothed out and, and we have to join together and to, to grow the kinds of foods that we're talking about. Healthy, good yeah, food it, that's it, nutritious and easily grown um, to, feed, to feed this nine billion population that the world is approaching. So, um, so I think that uh, you, you do all have to sit around the table and, and figure it out. 
uh, and uh, an article like the one in the New York Times, I was very taken aback, not just because I'm a supporter of App Harvest, but I was taken aback that there's the only way to grow is in, in composted soil of your own making. Uh, who, who the hell has this compost uh, that soil that, uh, that Dan Barber was talking about? Not all of us, very few of us. And, uh, and we have to really figure it out. And I'm, I, uh, I wow. applaud your efforts and the efforts of uh, other small companies or other companies that are doing similar things to what Jonathan is doing here in the United States. To mention a, a couple, there's um, Aero Farms, there's Bowery. Who else is doing this? Who's the vertical grower in San Francisco? Plenty. Um, there's, there are some other uh, companies that are, are, are emerging as futurists in uh, food production. So I think uh, we have to really look at these and, and, uh, and, uh, and really uh, group them as a, as a, a major group. We don't, not one, no one company is going to take over everything. But Jonathan at App Harvest is doing some other things uh, in the greenhouses. Talk about the robotics. This is, to me, so important too. Yeah, Martha. So we we acquired a robotics uh, company, an AI company. So again, data driven growing. You know, how do we optimize for the plant? We know what the plant wants. How do we give the plant exactly what it wants year round? And uh, so through through automation and AI and and, and data driven decisions, you know, we're able to give the plant exactly what it wants. But you know, something an important note. You know, for me personally, I'm a soil loyalist. You know, I'm kind of a naturalist earth hugger. I'm, I slept in Russell County last night looking at farms that we might build on. I mean, I'm I am the same person that, you know, a Wendell Berry and Dan Barber write about. I, I love their work, but we have to figure out how to work together. We, you know, Martha, I, again, the startling fact of how much food we need in the next 30 years. The U.N. Security Council came to Kentucky for the first time in our state history about a year ago. Uh, and we were able to visit with them. Ambassador from Russia, ambassador from China. This is an existential threat. You t so I was in Washington, D.C. about a month ago and met with a couple former U.S. generals. There's one thing that has always toppled governments in history, a lack of food and a lack of water. And when you don't have food and you don't have water, you don't have a society, you certainly don't have an economy. We have to work together and be clear eyed and be focused. And, and this is not competition. This isn't about money or a business. This is about how do we work together to ensure that people have better food consistently year round. And it's all of us going to have to sit at a table and share ideas and challenge each other. I love the challenge of always trying to get better. But we also need to not tear each other down and pull each other down uh, as we're all trying to think through the best ways to do this. It is startling, Martha. The math doesn't add up. We don't talk about it enough. All we talk about is clean energy, uh, you know, carbon reduction and, and, and global warming. And what is a world without food and water if we've already if we solve the energy problem if this world stays head down for the next 20 years only focused on on building renewable energy we're going to have to walk and chew gum at the same time we have to solve the energy problem while also solving a food problem while solving a water problem and we got to do it all at once uh, and we have to be clear eyed about it and work together and that's for me you know the new york times article uh it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's almost like anti-vaxxers. It's not based on science. And that's the frustrating thing. You know, we, you know, it, 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 th this concept that, oh, CEA products are in some way, you know, dangerous. They're not at all. There's, there's thousands of pages of research that, that, that say the complete opposite, but we can't, you know, run a world based on fear and panic and, and just, you know, have anti-vaxxer, anti-science sentiment out there. And we got to be careful in the food space. You know, people have to trust their food. They have to also know that, uh, you know, there, there are pathways to get good food. And, and frankly, it's going to be conversations like this, Martha, and, and the college you're at. You know, we've invited Tom Vilsack to Kentucky. I think he'll be coming in a month or two. But this has all happened under the USDA over the last 30 years. So, you know, we as the food community need to work together to build a better U.S. food supply. I'm not sure we can rely on D.C. to do that for us. 
Uh, but we need to figure out what are those clear parameters? What are the bright red lines we don't want to cross together? Uh, and what is the framework we want to work inside? But, you know, no one's going to come in and solve this for us. And I definitely don't think any of us can rely on DC to, to give us all the answers. So, you know, I invite Dan Barber to Kentucky. I'm a huge fan of Stone Barnes. Can Stone Barnes open up, you know, a central Appalachia farm? We'd love for you to do it. We'd love to teach the work. But let's figure out how we build a bridge and work together and, and not just, you know, throw statements out that, that kind of push everybody apart. Well, uh, Jonathan, describe what's the, what's the future of App Harvest in the next two years. I know you have uh, plans for building at least five or six more massive greenhouses. Uh, what, what, where are they? Uh, how difficult are they to build? Are you ready to do it? They're very hard to build because it's really big stuff. Uh, you know, three million square feet. Our first facility is uh, at one point looked like one of the largest ten structures in the world. Um, so this is big stuff. Uh, it, it's and so uh, we've set out to build twelve facilities by twenty twenty five. You know, forget me and forget App Harvest, but I think the thesis that we've coalesced around is Central Appalachia is going to be the largest produce hub of the U.S. We're going to bring production back from Mexico into the U.S. We're going to bring production from the southwest in California that's drought stricken further east. And we're going to put it in a water rich region that has abundant amount of rainwater uh, and get, get, get to 70 percent of the U.S. in a day drive. Martha, I know you've spent time with our governor here in Kentucky. Uh, he has made ag tech his number one priority in his administration outside of COVID, obviously. Uh, it's been, you know, number one is COVID, but outside of that, number one thing is is controlled environment agriculture. And and our, our political leadership here in this region really are scratching their head. What is this region going to be after the coal industry? And I think they've started, everybody's started to coalesce around this idea. Well, we're going to be high-tech farmers and we're going to feed the U.S. and we're going to do it with technology. We're going to align with nature and we're going to give good paying jobs to people uh, that deserve those jobs. So uh, where is App Harvest in two years? Well, at the end of next year, we'll have straw, you know, two leafy green facilities, strawberries, you know, a couple vine crop facilities. You know, but we're, we're zero focused on, on helping work with this region to make sure the entire region, not just App Harvest, uh, is one of the largest growers in the U.S. in the decades ahead. And, and any company or any nonprofit or any grower that, that wants to be a part of, you know, the renaissance of Appalachia, uh, Martha, give them my phone number. We'll invite them down. And, and we would love to have people come here and work with us. It's not easy, uh, but, but we're zero focused on, on the task. Well, congratulations, Jonathan. You're doing an amazing job and uh, in a very, very difficult situation uh, with tremendous challenges. But uh, I think you're up for the task. Uh, I thought we would uh, take some questions from the audience, if there are some. Uh, do, do people come up to a microphone? Or what do you, do you have runners? Oh, we have some runners. So um, here come the questions. There's one right over here. Two, three. Uh, over there, hands up. Hello. Yes. Um, I, uh, I've seen personal greenhouses, uh, zero energy input, that people build a greenhouse in the snow. There's some, and the, the idea struck me right away that that was something that you could do adjacent to your house to reduce your energy use in the first place. Uh, so while I, I think what you're doing is absolutely critical, uh, I, I would encourage you to sort of also push out your technology in some form to individuals to try to kind of unfortunately co compete with yourself but but to to try to distribute this because i think if you're looking at a solution uh that's that's an em enormous part of the solution if you look at the total area in the country that's available to not displace any anything agriculture anything growing uh, rooftops and the sides of houses are a tremendous way to, to do a double whammy. So my, my question, and I have tried to run the numbers myself as an electrical engineer, and I have not succeeded thus far, is is it possible to build a house that not only is greenhouse gas negative, that absorbs carbon, but that actually absorbs more carbon than the land it would be on if you potentially cleared agricultural land to do it, to build it? Did you get that, Jonathan? Yeah, a couple things. One, uh, yes, great, great question. Um, 
we're working with our five universities in Kentucky uh, and, and we want to open source as much information as possible to share that information with our universities. Uh, but 100 percent, it is not a matter of competition. You know, I'm I'm getting married in a couple of weeks. And, you know, for me, it's how do I ensure my kids can live in a better world than me? That's 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 the motivation. And any and every idea that that's on the table that gets us to a better place, it shouldn't. Th this sector should not be about competition. It should be about colleagues working together. But with that, uh, yes, there's there's a bit of a uh, Boyd Holbrook who is uh, from Eastern Kentucky. He was in Narcos and uh, is an actor. But me and him, he's a futurist out quite out there. Uh, yes, we have to figure out how to decentralize food production. And to your point, you know, can we provide open source information to allow people to grow uh, in their backyards and feed their communities? Yes, 100 percent. It's very possible. I mean, the technology is there. What is not there is is leadership. You know, we have no political leadership in this country. We have no leadership, you know, in the private sector that's willing to be open and transparent with consumers. Uh, there's a better way to do uh, all of this uh, related to indoor growing, uh, but but it, it's putting the power in people's hands and giving them the information. Uh, our universities here, I hope next year, are going to build, uh, start construction on a world class CEA research facility, uh, and that facility is going to be open to all the communities and let people come in and learn, figure out how they can do it uh, in their backyard. But uh, it is definitely possible and, and the technologies are there. You know, what we need to figure out how to do is how do we put that uh, knowledge into people's hands so they can execute on it. And we at App Harvest uh, we are already focused. On, we've invested nearly $500,000 in high school education uh, here in Kentucky. Uh, we, we're putting technologies at high schools already. Uh, and part of that was, you know, we could not rely on universities or schools in the U.S. to teach young people the skills they need for farming, not today, but tomorrow and five years from now. So we're putting technology at schools where they're using iPhones and iPads uh, to operate softwares and sensors and, and grow, uh, use LED lights and grow a fruit and vegetable uh, at their schools. So we're already doing it. Uh, but, but to your point, uh, is it possible and could it would it be more efficient for people to do it at their house? Yeah, absolutely. And in a perfect world, uh, hopefully we can all work together to, to make that a, a realistic possibility sooner rather than later. Thank you. Another question? There was somebody right here. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I first learned of App Harvest uh, from The Motley Fool. And um, oh. I studied up and became a very small shareholder in your company, um, motivated by what you're trying to do and especially by the social mission and providing uh, jobs to people who've been displaced uh, from other industries that needed to go. And then I was delighted to find out that Martha was on the board and bringing her expertise and passion to the project too. So um, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, what you're doing and especially in the context um, that you've described as a partner with other types of responsible agriculture. So what I um, want to ask about is what do you see as some of the larger challenges that um, the company and that CEA faces going forward, uh, putting aside the various disagreements and bickering? Yeah. I so to be, uh, Martha knows me a little bit at this point. I'm, I'm a little candid at times, and I'm going to go more on the candid side here. Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge, I think, for all of us, <laughs> just shut me down, Martha, if it goes off the rails. But uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest challenge, you know, for all of us that are trying really hard to grow more food ethically uh, in the right way, we have a real we have a real conversation to have in the U S in 2021, you know, you got farms in Mexico where people are making less than $5 a day. You have children that are working on those farms using illegal chemical pesticides that the EPA can't track. That is not fair to our friends and the communities down in Mexico. And it is not acceptable to get on a, on, on a fortune 500 shelf in the U S. And I think the biggest challenge for all of us that are trying to, 
to do the right thing and grow good food in the U.S. is we need to have a higher, higher standard as to what makes it into the American kitchen and onto the American table. And until we level set, these are not real prices. You know, these are artificially suppressed prices allowing illegal activity to take place on farming. And then those products make it onto, onto the kitchen table. So, you know, I, the biggest challenge is, is not, not anyone else in CEA. It's not any organic farmer. It's the illegal activity that we allow to happen on farms across North America. And those products make it into our families. Uh, homes. And, and we have to have a real conversation. Is, is that what we want to have happen in 2021? You know, is that is that acceptable? Uh, and if it's going to persist and we're going to allow it to be acceptable, then then it's going to be a challenge because ultimately, you know, here at App Harvest, we're competing with illegal activity. And then somehow we have to do that uh, and, and get onto the same uh, onto those same sales streams. So uh, it, it's a challenge. And I'm optimistic that, you know, we're at an inflection point and hopefully we'll turn the corner. But, you know, I hope five, 10 years from now, we're not having the same conversation and hopefully, you know, we can make significant progress sooner rather than later. Food is medicine and, and food is, is a critical part of health. And if, and if we don't have that honest conversation to ensure that everybody has good, clean, healthy food and we don't prioritize it, you know, then this industry is going to move pretty slow. Uh, but if we start to make it a priority in the U.S., you know, then we can see a dramatic change in our food system in five or less years. I think there's one more question over here. Yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned earlier that Wendell Berry was a big influence for you. Um, and Wendell Berry places a lot of uh, emphasis on the culture of agriculture. And I wonder if you could oh. speak to the way that CEA uh, can like respect and incorporate agricultural traditions, especially in the region in which you're working in. Um, how are you going to do that moving forward? Thank you. Yeah. So one is we, we have a CSA program every two weeks, we buy products from local farmers and we give it away to our employees. So we're trying to connect our employees with the local farming tradition. Um, also classes, you know, giving classes nights and weekends with, you know, what, what have we done traditionally in this region? What are those seed varieties that have worked outdoors? You know, but just the connection to food, you know, our facility, it, I would say is in less than a quarter of a percent of, of what it would look like uh, if you walk into a food facility. You know, we, we have it's people that are connected to plants and care about plants and they care about food, you know, but they love we love technology and we love innovation. And it's, it's an exciting environment. And I don't think it has to be a back and forth. And I love Wendell Berry. I do. Uh, but, you know, this idea of technology versus nature, what like. When did technology, when it, what is technology, right? So like Wendell Berry uses a tractor. I love Wendell, but like the tractor is a technology. And when the tractor was first introduced to American farming, people were freaked out and panicked. And then they realized, oh, well, I can jump on the tractor. And it actually, it actually is maybe a good thing. Uh, you know, the robotics, the AI, the data we're using, those are just tools. They're technology, same thing as the wheel. And so we as humans, the, the important part about all this as we go forward is that people need to align with nature and grow food in a better way. The technology should not dictate that. The technology is a tool for us to use, but people need to be in control of that technology. And that, that's going to be a fundamental question that we have in the later years, which is, do we grow in a black box with a bunch of AI, with no humans, and, and, and that's the way we grow food. Here at App Harvest, uh, we believe people should be at the center of food uh, and people should use the technology, you know, but we're in control of the technology. And ultimately, uh, again, putting nature first. So we push with technology from behind, uh, but use sunlight. We use rainwater. Again, what are those natural elements that the planet already gives us? Well, sunlight and rainwater. So we only turn on LED lights when we don't have enough sunlight. So, you know, it, it's it's a long conversation. We definitely can't have it here in 45 minutes, but it's one that we're all going to have to get to the table. And hopefully in a perfect world in five or 10 years, you've got Wendell Berry, Dan Barber, and a couple of futurist technologists growing food 
all at the same table talking about how do we grow better food together? And it definitely doesn't need to be an us versus them, but let's all figure out how we can learn from each other and, and do it better together. Thank you both so much for this. It was a really interesting discussion. Um, so you mentioned technology, and you mentioned that you use non-GMO seeds. Um, and you know, GMOs got a bad rap for a lot of reasons that were well-deserved, and maybe some that were more fear-based and um, a misunderstanding. You know, and there were some real legitimate concerns around the use of GMOs. But I'm wondering, you know. Um, I think there are uses for GMOs that go beyond transportation. I'm thinking like flood resistant rice in Bangladesh. And so yep. basically, what I'm wondering is um, seems like they are going to be a necessary part of solving the global food insecurity problem just because of scale. So I'm wondering where you think they might fit into that, and I'm wondering in what ways you think the regulation in the United States might have to change, or globally might have to change to incorporate them responsibly. I'm personally not against GMOs, but it goes back to, you know, we, we these news articles come out and regulators talk, and unfortunately, you're right, it's back to like the anti-vaxxer conversation. It's not based in science. Well. Uh, you know, we don't use GMO because we don't need to. We're controlling the environment. So if you're using that seed variety in Bangladesh to grow in a, in a flood stricken region, you're doing it because you have, you know, you have extreme weather outdoors. We just don't need to. We can use a naturally bred seed. Is there a, a large benefit to it? There's no real scientific evidence that shows that there is. But for us, uh, we just don't need to use a GMO seed. But to your point, you know, again, it needs to be what tools are we going to use in our toolkit to ensure we can have healthy food consistently affordable for everyone? Uh, and if GMO is a part of that, then GMO needs to be a part of that in certain places of the world and certain products. Uh, and it's not that, you know, me specifically or our company is against GMO. Uh, we just don't need to use it. So we don't use it. But incredibly good point. And it goes back to the the unfortunate uh, scenario that the consumer in the U.S. has really no idea what they should be scared of. I mean, you, you look at China today, China doesn't trust their food system the same way the U.S. in like the late 1800s, we didn't trust our food system. You know, that you would you would have, you would go to a store, you would buy something in the late 1800s, you had no idea what was in it. You had no idea if it was, you know, what, what was going. And so, it's an evolution and there's some places of the world that are behind us on that evolution, you know, but still here and today in 2021, you know, the largest economy in the world and we still don't have uh, consumers that trust our food system and questioning, is this good? Is this bad? And, and ultimately it's going to be, you know, people like you, us and, you know, this conversation and, and, and trying to co coalesce around, what are the real fears that we should be scared of and we don't want to have on our table? And what are the things that are marginal uh, that don't, you know, are not, are not real concerns for us to have? And, and, and GMO is a perfect example of that. It's something that's spun incredibly out of control. And, and still today in the U S people have a fear of consuming a GMO product. And uh, it just goes to show the misinformation and distrust that the U S consumer has with, with what food is being sold. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Oh, is it right here. Um, this may be more of an economics question, but um, in many of the presentations over this week, it sounds. Can you hear, can you hear him? Can you hear him, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, yes, oh, here. Um, oh, thank you. Um, in many of the presentations this week, uh, it sounds like food's too cheap, and um, you you talk about the consumers that are going to lower price places and getting poisoned by the food, will there need to be at some point uh, higher expensed food to create the health that, that we're hoping for? And how do we get people to be able to afford that? I love that question. Well, can we stop subsidizing all the food that poisons us? I mean, the fact that fruits and vegetables aren't subsidized, but we subsidize high fructose corn syrup, uh, high saturated fats, 
I mean, there's a reason why the dollar menu is a dollar menu and it's not because it's fair market. It's everything on that dollar menu is heavily subsidized. It, nothing about agriculture or food is a free market. It's, it's a complete fallacy. That's a joke. So I love the question and you're exactly right. But the real cost of food, we have to incorporate health. Health care is going to bankrupt this country. You know, COVID, you look at COVID. Why has it impacted the U.S. so bad? Well, high obesity rates, high diabetes rates. We have an unhealthy population that is vulnerable. And the real cost of food is we can either pay for good, healthy food on the front end, or we're going to pay on the back end to solve for the problem after we have the unhealth con. There's so many ways to solve for this, you know, but one thing would be DC, get out of our way and stop subsidizing terrible food and, and making it artificially cheap. Uh, I, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's, you would think there's an administration in the White House right now that would be sympathetic to these conversations uh, and, and be progressive enough to think about how this is actually impacting the American people. I'm hopeful. I mean, you know, hopefully they can figure it out in the next couple of years because every American deserves to have good, clean, healthy food. That is a human right, period. End of story. Everybody deserves clean water and everybody deserves clean, healthy food. I don't care how we get there, but we as a country, if we're supposed to be the largest, greatest country on planet Earth, then we need to figure out how every American can have good, clean, healthy food. Uh, and the challenge goes to D.C. You know, there's a couple cabinet secretaries in the White House can all get in a room and go go meet with Congress and Senate tomorrow and change all this. So um, I, there's 50 different ways to solve for it, uh, but there has to be leadership somewhere. Uh, in D.C. that's going to be helpful because right now what's happened in D.C. is we've created uh, a market that is heavily subsidizing really bad food that's really, really poisoning our people day to day. And um, how do we get there? Who knows? But I'm hopeful and and whatever we can do at App Harvest to, to be a part of that conversation, which I have. I've been to D.C. the last month several times, and and this is resonating on both the right and left side of the aisle. So will there be any progress who knows, but but at least we're all talking about it and somewhat cognizant of it. Okay, one more question. Okay, there. Hi, I'm Sarah Alexander. I'm the executive director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. We're the oldest and largest statewide organic advocacy group in the country, and I agree with so much of what you've said today, and I agree it's a both and, and we need to be at the same table and, and talking. Um, and our common... Um, enemy, if you will, is the corporate controlled industrial food system that, that is producing the, the food that is making us all unhealthy. And so um, as a socially responsible company that's trying to do all this really great work, how can you just talk a little bit about how you're working to tackle that corporate control? I mean, you're, you're, how do we ensure that you know, you're going after the market that really is that um, produce that we don't want to see on our shelves and that's the market share that you're taking so that all of the folks that are doing really positive, good agriculture um, can all have a share of the market. Well, if we're at the end, near the end of the talk, it, we'll, we'll kind of throw the Hail Marys here. I mean, the reality is, you know, we, the, the U.S. food system is a $1.1 trillion a year. We, we consume $1.1 trillion worth of food stuff in the U.S. every year. Uh, that if you if you look at the environmental and health impacts, it's actually closer to three trillion dollars. Very little of that is good, clean, healthy food or for like you, uh, an organic farmer association, good organic food. We need to torch and burn the American food system, period. And the large food companies. So we've been talking about vegetables and you know, vegetables with too many chemicals on them. You know, but let's look at food in a grocery store in general. 80% of it is just poisoning us. Uh, it's got to go. And, and we have to fight back. And I'm hopeful. I, you know, Martha, I'm, a, I've, I'm 36. I got a lot of energy. Uh, hopefully I can do this another 30, 40 years. And, and I've, I know some other CEOs that are equally passionate as, as me or maybe more so. 
Uh, and it, 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 this is going to be a fight and we need to change regulation in D.C. We need to drive some of these companies into bankruptcy. We need to get CEOs fired and management teams fired. We have to push on all fronts. And that's why if we're a unified front, you know, from the organic farmer, you know, to the, the CEO of a company that's trying to do it right, let's work together and let's create a common thread. And that common thread needs to be, we need to tackle this food system head on uh, and, and unrelentingly push. The good thing is, if you look at Gen Z and millennial and, and the consumer trends, those Gen Z and millennials are eventually going to be your politicians. They're going to be your next CEOs. And they all want the same thing of what we've been talking about today. They want a better food system. So history's on our side. Uh, we just got to push unrelentingly uh, to, to get you know, better food onto American plates, no matter what that is. Uh, and, and I think challenge each other and say, hey, you know, you can do better. Let's let's fit in. But let's make this a collegial, friendly way of how we work together uh, and be zero focused on on what what we actually want to displace. And that's that's the overall 80 percent of junk uh, that's going into a grocery today. So, again, I think you all can hear in my voice. I'm incredibly passionate about this for a lot of reasons. Martha, please feel free to share my contact information with with anyone that's there at the college. Uh, and we want to be a helpful voice. And, you know, we're down here in Appalachia. And I think this has been considered flyover uh, region for America for a long time. Uh, but Appalachia is fired up. And, and we, uh, you can hear to me, but we have 550 people at this company that, that are waking up every day to solve these same problems. And, and we would love to work with anyone at the college that, that might want to be helpful with us in, in whatever way we can best all move forward together. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, audience, for uh, your great questions and your attention. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, and thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's a pretty amazing morning. We started with Anishinaabe rice cultivation and ended in CEA, and really. That diversity is, is kind of what we're going for here with the Institute. Um, I just want to remind people that next week, anyone who's registered for any session will receive a questionnaire. We want to get feedback of what we can do better, different, et cetera. Keep an eye out for that. But also keep an eye that at 5 o'clock, we'll have David and Susan Rockefeller here in conversation with Dan Barber, which is really exciting. So uh, that'll be our last session. We're, again, very thankful for Martha, who, in, uh, with, with a leg that's getting better and better every second, um, made it here, and it was, it was really delightful. So thank you very much, and, and thank you. Thank you.